Okay, then we have the next presentation, and we have three authors for this one. That also looks at the TSN shapers. And uh, Max, are you going to present by yourself? Or? It's, it's just me up here. Okay, we have Anna also Engelmann there, who is a co author, but evidently not presenting. That's fine. And uh, I leave the floor to you, I'd say. Uh, do I have to mention that you are the chair of the 802.1 DG profile? Maybe that's worth mentioning in case anybody wants the automotive TSN profile input discussion to move forward more. Max is the person to talk to. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kirsten, for the introduction. And yeah, for any DG questions or for other questions, I'm over at the Ethernovia booth. Um, yeah, so welcome to this talk about arbitrating the fight between 802.1 QTSN shapers. Um, and this is a work together that we did with Anna Engelmann of Cariat, um, the software group within Volkswagen, and also Jean Valrand, who is a professor or was a professor at UC Berkeley. And after Manfred's talk, I feel I'm kind of starting um, from a very good starting point because he laid the groundwork from what I want to be talking to you about. I will go one step back in my first slide of talking about more the fundamentals of why do we do shaping. And I'm gonna say if you wanna get something anywhere as fast as possible, please don't do shaping. It's not gonna do the trick. Um, I wanna introduce to you then what uh, is called here the cruise network calculus model. It's a mathematical model. I will not go into details. When we did the review for this, a lot of people were worried that I'm gonna bug you with a lot of math. Um, what is shown on the slides in math is supposed to support what I'm telling you on the soundtrack. We're then gonna go into the credit-based shaper and the asynchronous traffic shaper. We're gonna be comparing the two, sort of very similarly to what we heard in the previous talk. And what is not listed here, I'm gonna give you a few comments about the interaction with the time of air shaper. And lastly, we're gonna look at the role of priority. Is priority really the thing that we want to look at in the network or aren't there actually parameters that might be more important? And then finally, we'll end up with a few conclusions and there I hopefully find a few people that disagree with those and we can have a good discussion over a beer tonight. Problem statement. I stole this from Janos Farkas from an introductory to the IEEE. And I'm gonna cut this a little short because you guys know all of this. And actually Manfred mentioned it. The main important thing is we want to prevent our buffers from overflowing. We want to know how much buffers we need to put in the bridges in order to make sure that our bridges do not drop traffic. Now, when people show you this slide, they tell you that this is what TSN does. But where do we apply TSN? What flows do we actually apply TSN to? And to me, actually, more importantly, what happens to the rest of them? There isn't just TSN traffic. There is other traffic potentially as well. What happens to that traffic? And why did we not apply TSN to that other traffic? Yeah, the other thing I do want to point out, and this is why I said if you want to get it there as fast as possible, look at the middle column and see what happens on the top and happens on the bottom. The average latency of any shaped traffic will be higher than the average latency of your normal traffic that you didn't shape. Because all the shaper does is it holds back traffic. If you shape stuff, it's gonna take longer. The advantage is you know how long, but it's gonna take longer, yeah? It's a, I think it's a very important point to, to, to make at the beginning here. The goals of shaping. I wanna introduce to you the concept of burstiness, and I'm gonna go into a little more detail of what I mean by burstiness on the next slide. What we actually want to do is we want to introduce gaps into what we call bursts in order for other traffic to actually use these gaps, get into there and be transmitted. Why are we doing that? Because if we're holding up the line with that traffic that we started out with and it doesn't give that gap, then we're seeing that as a delay for the rest of the traffic. 
Yeah? So if we actually shape one traffic, it's not the delay of that traffic that we're trying to reduce. It's all the rest of the traffic where we're trying to reduce the latency. That's why we do shaping. That's why we want to have gaps between our packets so that other traffic gets a chance to actually um, access the bus. And I'm talking way too much. <laughs> the problem is retransmissions don't work with that. And Don and, and Manfred mentioned that. Retransmissions are an unpredictable source of bandwidth. We have to prevent, under all circumstances, retransmissions. You cannot, in advance, guess their bandwidth demand. They're going to kill you. Now, what triggers retransmissions? Retransmissions are triggered by frame losses. So we cannot allow frames to be dropped. That must be our top goal. And how we do that differs, or how we could do that, differs obviously for the methodology. And since I'm a little behind on my timing here, um, I'm going to actually skip on to the next slide. And we want to talk a little bit about the cruise network calculus model. We're not going to do the math. All we're going to do is do the bottom line here. And I'm going to tell you that what we call burstiness can actually be mathematically equated with the fill level, your maximum backlog in a buffer. And that's actually cool because that's what we want to design, as Manfred just pointed out. We want to know how much buffer we need. It's burstiness. So if you compare it on the left-hand side, basically you want to spread what is now bunched up in these blue boxes and you have large gaps in between, you want to spread it out. You want to evenly spread it out so other traffic has a chance to jump in and is not held up by the traffic we're talking about here. The thing that we want to, that we're saying that we want to prevent is what I'm showing on here. What happens if we have bursty traffic coming into from two ports and we want to send it out on another port. Basically, we're bunching this traffic together. Yeah, We're increasing the burst size. The cool thing is, if we use the cruise model, even this model has a limited burst size. Under what constraint does it have a limited burst size? I know the input. If I know how bursty the input is, I can tell you how bursty the output is even without a shaper, yeah? But this will actually be true for everything that we do. We need to know the input, and this is why I'm going to regurgitate sort of what Manfred said before. It is important that we know what goes into the network. We can't pretend I'm a bridge and I have no idea how my environment, how my input looks like, and then fix it. Credit-based shaper. Manfred talked a lot about it. The big point about the credit-based shaper, it was not meant to get stuff anywhere as quickly as possible. It was meant to introduce the maximum amount of gaps between frames, spread them out as far as possible, but still stick to a upper bound latency. That what it was designed to do. The downside, and Manfred mentioned that as well, the downside is it is doing that for multiple inputs and it is doing it on an aggregate. So it's not doing it on a per flow basis, it does it for an aggregate. So if there is a bursty aggregate coming in, that burst is just going to be inherited onto the other side. And I'm not solving any of that problem. I'm solving the problem for the overall aggregate, but not for any of the flows. In a lot of cases, it actually doesn't matter. But there is a particular case that you can see in the Q standard in, uh, in Annex L3, if I believe correctly, that when you split flows, this is going to haunt you. You're going to get these permanent delays that are described there. You're going to get aggregated buffer. Um, so is it a good idea to actually shape with the credit-based shaper? Yes, it might be if your flows are destined to the same destination. 
Does that have anything to do with priority? Probably not. The asynchronous traffic shaper, if you look at it from the mathematical model of one flow going in, going through, going out, it's actually not that different. There is a few other succinct differences between the ATS and the CBS as they're described in 802.1 um, AS. And first of all, the ATS gives you two configuration parameters. In the CBS, the only configuration parameter you have is basically, it's called the idle slope. It's the bandwidth that you're reserving um, in your stream, and that's all you have. Because what we call high credit is actually calculated from that. The ATS gives you one more parameter. It gives you a burstiness parameter. It tells you how large that initial burst can be. Remember, if you send a bunch of packets into a credit-based shaper, they will come out very, very slowly. For the ATS, you can define an initial burst at maximum burst level. And it might just send some of those out initially and actually burst them through. So there is an additional parameter that you want to be able to control or that you need to be able to control the cool part is if you actually set that parameter to the frame size, the nominal behavior that you get on the outside is very, very, very similar to what you get for the credit-based shaper. So why are they different if I'm telling you they're the same? Well, they're not the same. There's a big difference, but that is not the shaper itself. It's the way that the queues are set up in 802.2.1 queue because what it described there is that frames from different input ports need to go to different shapers. Remember the, the famous graphics of, of Don Panel about the maximum delay that we calculate in 1BA. It assumes frames coming in on different ports and going into the same credit-based shaper. Those would actually go into different ATS shapers even though they belong to the same traffic class. Obviously, that needs a little bit of hardware effort to handle this kind of multiple shapers and multiple queues. And I work for a hardware manufacturer, so if you're looking for hardware that in the future can actually do that, you wanna be coming to that booth later on, yeah? Um, and, and talk to us how we can do that. So the main point in difference is we can actually do this on a per flow basis and not on a per class basis. Because remember the classes keep these bunches together and here we can actually separate them out. We can actually make room for it. Now I forgot something I realized on my slide before. I promised you that I was gonna talk about how this interacts with the time of air shaper. Miserably. Because the ATS, if you look at the math that was put in there, it tries to predict a point in time when a frame should be transmitted. Well, what is it predicting if it doesn't know the gate cycle that comes in that time of air shaper afterwards? It's not predicting anything, yeah? So this shaping that the ATS does relies on that actually that, that uh, eligibility time actually has something to do with when we're transmitting this. But if there is a time of air shaper behind it, well, I don't know whether it's gonna be transmitted or not. It might be sitting there for 500 microseconds or whatever long you close that gate. And the same for the credit-based shaper. Actually, there is a rule in one queue that for the credit-based shaper, you increase the rate for your credits when your gate opens in order to compensate for the time that your gate was closed. What does that mean? It means burstiness. You're bursting out your frames at a higher rate. You're achieving the, the contrary of what actually the credit-based shaper was made for. You're bunching it closer together again. Yeah, so putting a timer wave shaper um, actually behind these two guys is, is basically, it, it's throwing a log between their feet. They can't operate anymore in the way that were, they were designed. It's not their job. So I suggest let's not do that. 
Comparing the two without the time of air shaper, we're gonna ignore the time of air shaper. I think Manfred already said we don't wanna use it. Let's just compare the credit-based shaper and the, um, and the asynchronous traffic shaper a little bit. And this is, somebody said in the review that this was way too much information. I trust you guys understood my slides before and you can actually read this. You see the ATS on the right hand side, is that the right side? Yeah, it should be. Um, and the CBS on the left hand side. And again, the most important part is that flows from different input ports get treated very, very differently in ATS and, and in CBS. In CBS, they end up in one queue and they end up in a more or less random sequence. So you're gonna get this random um, delay of frames because they came in on a different port. This is what that 1BA formula um, actually tells you is what's gonna happen. ATS has the chance of actually pulling these flows apart. It can also bunch them together if you configure the burst size appropriately. Yeah? ATS requires hardware support. Let's, let's not forget that. It is more effort. That's what people are, like my company, are here for, for you to solve. Yeah? Um, the ATS requires a lot more configuration because there is not just the PCP that gets looked at. It's not just the priority. You need a little bit more information. You need to know what's going on um, in your network. But in, if you do, then the ATS can actually improve your link utilization. And I would argue link utilization in a vehicle is basically getting bucks for your money. Because if we put in a 10 gigabit link and we're only transferring 50 gigabit, megabit over it, it's kind of a waste of money, right? We want to use our link. We don't want the link to be sitting there idle. We want to actually use it. We want to have a justification to have used it. Um, and so in very high usage used uh, networks, the ATS will actually get you a way better throughput, way better latency, because its goal was not to spread things out as far as possible. It spreads them out far enough, let's say. The split flows, and this is where it really gets tricky. Like I said before, the credit-based shaper has a problem as soon as you shape stuff together that later on down the road gets split up. So why did you do that? You did that because priority or some pseudo priority was your criterion for putting stuff into traffic classes. But why? Why did we put stuff into that traffic class? We're actually getting a downside from that. We're getting this permanent delay. We're getting that buffer buildup. Yeah? Why don't we use a different criterion? Why don't we use destination as a criterion? And we shape stuff together that stays together. And actually at the very end where we split it up to the listeners, there's absolutely no point in shaping anything there. It's already at that bridge. Let's deliver it up to the, to, to the, to the listener um, and solve the problem up there, yeah? But in all of this, the assumption is we know how our network actually behaves from the beginning. And can we rescue any of that with priority? Well, priority was meant to allow frames of high priority to find a gap within frames of low priority, yeah? What it wasn't meant to do was doing something the other way around. As soon as my high priority traffic has control over the port, the port is taken. The low priority traffic will suffer. It will it will starve in the worst case, which is why we put, for example, a credit-based shaper in the highest priority, so we actually get gaps. So we can intervene and actually get the low priority traffic in and share the bandwidth more freely um, across all of, these, um, all of these flows. So going back to my statement from before, 
Our goal must be never to retransmit anything. This whole concept of TCP retransmitting after a packet loss is a disaster for our automotive network because we want predictable bandwidth usage. We don't have this case like in the internet where a router is completely blocked for, I don't know, a few microseconds, a few milliseconds. And if it drops a frame and the frame gets transmitted later a few milliseconds, then the router is open and there is space. It's not the traffic pattern that I believe that is predominant in a vehicle. In a vehicle, it was mentioned before, we have a lot of sources that are actually automatically shaped. A camera is basically, in a way you could argue it's automatically shaped. A, a microphone, definitely. A speaker is a listener that needs shaped traffic, otherwise the whole thing doesn't make a lot of sense. So we want to prevent this congestion loss, but if we do that with priority, what do we need to look for most? It's the highest priority traffic. The highest priority traffic is the most dangerous traffic in your network because it can block out everything else. And since everything else might include best effort traffic, so TCP traffic, you are now starting to retransmit because you dropped it and you did all of that because your high priority traffic was for some reason misbehaving. Get your high priority traffic under control. And I can only reiterate what, what Manfred said, get it under control at the source. There is no point in every switch in the network assuming something might have gone wrong and then trying to fix it. Yeah, we need to make sure that what goes into this network actually makes sense. And the consequence is, if we do want to police something, the stuff that we need to look at most closely is our highest priority traffic because it can take away bandwidth from everything else. And if that everything else then gets retransmitted, we're in an absolute bandwidth disaster. Combining the credit-based shaper with priority you need that if you have other cues. If you had a credit-based shaper on every traffic class, there'd actually be no need for a priority because the credit-based shaper leaves the gaps. If every traffic class leaves the gaps, there is no problem. Only if you have a traffic class down below that could occupy the bus for a longer time, then you need the priority in order to make sure that the fair guys on top with the credit-based shipper actually get the word in. For the ATS, it's a little different. You have the configurable burst size. So for ATS, you want that priority in order to not move away everybody else. You want the other guys to get a chance. So what's the idea? What's the conclusion from all of that? Actually, I think you could probably build a network with a credit-based shaper only, and you're gonna hear about it in about 45 minutes. Yeah? The higher loaded your network is, the more utilization of your links you have, the more you wanna go towards ATS. But the big message is, if you have your talkers under control, and you do some reasonable traffic shaping on sort of what we would call the high priority stuff, and you do the policing in order to make sure the high priority stuff actually sticks to those limits, then there might actually be traffic that you don't need to reshape at every, at every, uh, at every bridge. And I'm talking about reshaping because I'm talking about a talker behaving Usefully, and I'm not only talking about those AVB talkers, I also want those TCB talkers to behave in a good way and not overrun the network and then hope for the bridges to come to the rescue and for whatever buffers hold up the traffic and try to fix it. So, credit based shaper is definitely your friend. Um, and I'm gonna tell you in the next talk when it becomes even more your friend, but the asynchronous traffic shipper gives you a little more freedom. It gives you the ability to use your, um, your links uh, more efficiently. It really becomes a lot better the higher usage you have. And somewhere in here, there was a typo, might've been in the next talk. 
Conclusion, shape flows at the talkers. You've now heard it in two talks, please do it. And talkers means middleware, Comstack, NIC, or even your application if you can. But shape at the talkers in order to allow the shapers and the bridges to do their job. If they do not know what the input is, they basically don't really know what their output is and we don't know what they're gonna lose on the way to that output, yeah? If you feel that you need to reorder, priority is an option, but we need to make sure that even the low priority traffic does not get dropped because retransmission is gonna kill all our bandwidth calculations that we did at the beginning. And Kirsten and my telephone are reminding me to come to the end. Um, the cruise network model that I presented to you gives you a very easy way of finding an upper bound to all of this. There is no big need of doing huge um, simulations in detail, at least not at the beginning. And with that, thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you, Max. Max, I have a question to you before the first uh, <laughs> other question now reaches the microphone. Um, how are you solving this in the um, automotive profile, DG, the traffic shaping? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Um, and I think I need some help here from the audience in order to do that. Uh, because as was pointed out before, a lot of the Q standards actually mention the trackers but very few people read that part. <laughs> so maybe we need to introduce an actual section in not just saying, hey, this is the shaper, this is how you do it in the talker. Maybe we gotta have a section, this is how you build your talker in order to not mess up your network. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Trista? Yes, I get a question. Thank you very much for this presentation. In fact, before entering the automobile domain, I was working in the sensor network domain. Um, there were lots of studies on the person sir, and how to deal with the traffic shaping. Uh, that is a, a really uh, important topic. But uh, when you are looking at the old algorithm, in fact, uh, the traffic shaping, either you look at it from an individual interest or a group interest. And, uh, Oh, the person is problem that's in the distribution that's uh, usually in the wireless network we call it a heavy tie distribution. So if you want to care other less prioritized messages in order to guarantee a total network delay means you are working on the group benefit, right? Absolutely. So then I get a question in my brain. Have you ever seen about to use things like a GAN theory? to make such kinds of study uh, in order to improve the quality of service. So you mean like a dynamic reaction to an, over, to an overload? True, yes. Uh, if you are in Wallis Network, uh, usually you have uh, individual yeah. interests, uh, group interests, yeah. uh, and you can uh, change your kinds of uh, configuration based on the interest you want to work on. And when it's group one, for sure, the retransmission and packet loads are the most important resource in the network. But uh, as an individual device, most important is I can send out my traffic, I don't really care my neighbors. Uh, so that's uh, quite different ideas uh, while implementing uh, the algorithm. So my argument would be, I think we need to build the automotive network differently than we build the internet. Mm -hmm. Because in the internet, that's exactly the idea. Everybody pushes their traffic out, and if there is room for it, it'll go through. And if there is no room, I'll redo it a little bit later, and then there is most likely room, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we created, I don't know, has, is somebody keeping count of the congestion algorithms in TCP? I've lost count, I gotta be honest. But this is exactly what we're trying to solve there. But why do we do that in automotive? Where is that ECU that generates uncontrolled traffic? Uh -huh. Yeah? Nobody is building, quote unquote, on purpose an ECU that generates this random uncontrolled traffic. I think we have a very, very high base level of network load, and we gotta make sure we're leaving enough gaps 
so that that TCB download of a website, that streaming download from Spotify, they need to go in the middle. But actually, as soon as you give that matrix, that framework of the base traffic, everything else can only go in those gaps that are created by ATS or CBS. So they become pseudo-shaped. <laughs> they can't just go and say, I am unshaped traffic, I'm doing whatever I want. It doesn't work that way. Because otherwise you're bunching the rest together and then you're, you're disturbing the, the functionality of a camera, of a microphone. So I'm arguing, let's not build the automotive ECUs like we build computers. Let's make them behave a lot better. Can I have the second question? Yes, go ahead, please. Um, that's, uh, uh, as we say now, the, in the car, we, we start to look at the really lots of high performance issue in the vehicle. And so a lot of them have uh, kinds of a virtual machine inside. And then you can have a kinds of virtual switch uh, to manage the communications uh, between them. So um, when you are working on the traffic shaping uh, strategy in the group uh, benefits, uh, means uh, each uh, virtual machine, they can also have their own traffic shaping model and they might not consider the, the whole network behavior. So uh, to consider the group of benefits means you need kinds of, a, um, I would say master or network orchestrator to coordinate all the communication things. So do you have uh, any uh, comments on the implementation of uh, uh, such kinds of uh, so my, my first argument would be, if we're building these big compute boxes, mm -hmm. the thing these big compute boxes have to spare is memory, right? Mm -hmm. These are big computers, they have a ton of memory. And so my argument would be with the talk before, they can actually buffer up their traffic and let it go when it's good for the network. They don't need to rely on all the tiny switches in the network to actually fix that problem. If I'm that big computer and I have a lot of RAM, then I can actually let the traffic out in a way that it is, like you say, it's for the group benefit. Mm -hmm. I don't need, there is no benefit for me. I have the memory, the stuff is not gonna get out any faster. In the worst case, I need to keep it longer and retransmit it. For me, as this big compute box with lots of memory, there is no benefit of pushing stuff out and not knowing whether it gets there. So let's behave nicely, make it easy for the network, keep the buffers in the switches low, and then there is no downside. Do we do this configuration up front, or do we do that at some point dynamically? I think that's a completely different discussion like we had a few talks ago. Do you want to handle the complexities of dynamic configuration, the authentication, who can change what parameter in your network. There is a lot of stuff to consider behind the whole software-defined network mm. that doesn't show up in traffic shaping. Mm. So I would say let's get a configuration that's aware of the group interest and that considers the whole network. If we want to do that static or dynamic depends on completely other parameters. Mm, that's true. We often have a software engineer don't really understand network, and network engineer don't really know the need of software. So I think it's a really beautiful topic uh, in uh, that one DG. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your <laughs> response. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you also. We have no more questions. Then thank you, Max. Thank you.